takes more, more than a hammer, more than a hammer and nails. Takes more than a hammer and nails. A firm foundation built on faith and love. Whole lot of guidance from up above. Show your neighbor what a friend is for with an open heart and an open door. It takes more, more than a hammer and nails. Wow, well, good morning, church. Good morning. What a great day. What a great day. I'm so excited about what God's doing in us and through us for his name and for his glory. I'm sporting a little community group t-shirt today because community groups are kicking off tonight and this week. And I just encourage you to jump in a group. And maybe you haven't ever been in a group or been a part of a group. But I want to tell you what a difference it will make in your lives. And uh, I know it has for me. And in our groups in the past and just sharing life together and walking with people as they've been baptized, walking with people through hard times as well and praying for one another, and it makes a huge difference in your life. I don't know how people make it in life without Christ, first and foremost, right? But I don't know how people make it in life without community, without brothers and sisters to walk with you through the good times and through the hard times. So jump in and be a part of a community group somewhere. You can find out more information. Also, welcome back to our series. We're in this great series called House to Home, and I love what God is teaching us in this series. Now, we started the first week, and we said anytime you build a house, and we're in a hot market right now, right? So anywhere you go in Franklin and Spring Hill and Thompson Station and Brentwood and Nashville, there are houses going up anywhere. And, and listen, anytime you build a house, the first thing you do is lay a foundation. And we've said this, that if the foundation is off, the house is not going to stand, right? I and mean, it doesn't matter how good everything else is or how great the furniture is. It doesn't matter if the foundation is off. So you lay the right foundation for your home. And so often people try to lay the wrong foundation. They get caught up in the world and they try to lay a foundation of, of money or of kids, you know, or success. And that becomes the foundation of their home. And, and those things change, right? As much as we love our kids, they, they grow up and, and they move out. And we don't want them to, but they do. It just happens. Money, man, it's here today and sometimes the stock market can change and it's not, you know. I mean, things happen. It's success. It's, man, you're rolling and then sometimes you're not. And, what we found is this, is the foundation of your home and the foundation of your life must be Christ. And Christ alone, because Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And there is a God who loves you so much that he sent his one and only son. And when Christ becomes the foundation of your home, that's where everything begins to fall into place. And so you search your heart, you say, is Christ the Lord of my heart? Is Christ the Lord of my life? Is Christ the Lord of my home? And does my home radiate Christ? Now we said once the foundation is placed, then you begin to put up the walls, right? And the walls go up and the walls provide definition. The walls provide the purpose of the house or the building. The walls also provide protection. And they also provide, right, the stability that you put on the roof, which we'll do today. Now we said last week, if there's cracks in the walls, though, we can so easily ignore those cracks. We can so easily try to cover over those cracks. But we are called to fix those cracks. Deal with those cracks. Because if we don't, the walls will deteriorate. If you missed last week, I encourage you to go back and listen to the podcast. Go back and watch. Because we talked about protecting our marriage. We talked about protecting our home. And it's so important for us not just to brush over things in our home. Things that may have been passed down. Maybe even generational sin. And we just kind of sweep it under the rug instead of stepping into it and say, no, 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 no. I'm going to be the man or woman of God and deal with this in my home. And we're going to pray. We're going to work it together as a family so that our home will stand strong. And today we're putting on the roof, right? The roof. Now, the roof doesn't get a lot of love. Well, let's be honest, right? There, you know, we spend all of our time on the inside. You know, we spend all of our time, you know, going through and picking out the carpet or the hardwood floors, the tiles. We spend a lot of time, you know, trying to figure out kitchen cabinets and all this. We spend a lot of time on the walls with the paint and the wallpaper and the furniture. But we don't spend hardly any time on the roof. All right, we just, we just don't. You know, the, the roof's just kind of up there, and the roof takes a lot of abuse, let's be honest, right? And a lot of hail coming down the roof and snow and everything. When I was in high school, one night we had a giant game, it was a senior in high school, we had a giant game of hide-and-go-seek, 
And uh, so I had the entire basketball team. We were hiding up on our roof because <laughs> nobody's going to find us up there, right? Until about 2 in the morning when we come running off of the roof and jumping to try to get to the base. And my dad came out. He's like, there's a herd of elephants on our roof. What's going on? And we were like, that ended that game. That was fun, though, for a little while. So, but the roof, man, it just takes abuse. Right? Anytime you go on a mission trip, nobody wants to work on the roof. Everybody wants to be on the inside, you know. But the roof, it doesn't have a lot of sizzle. It doesn't have a lot of glam. But, you know, think about it if you didn't have a roof. <laughs> What's going to happen? Everything in stride is going to be destroyed. Right? The rain's going to come in. The snow's going to come in. The hail's going to come in. Everything inside is going to be destroyed. Any house, any building to survive needs a roof. And any home to survive needs a covering covering of God's blessing, a covering of God's grace, a covering of God's hand, a covering of God. See, we've said this in this series, that there's a difference between a house and a home. And all of us know it, right? So you, you grew up in a house, and man, you wish you'd grown up in a home. But the fact of the matter is this, that all of us now have the opportunity, whether you're in an apartment or a condo or a townhome or a home or a house, listen, you have the opportunity to make it a home. Make it a place where God thrives. Make it a place where people want to be. Make it a place that impacts generations for the glory of God. This is your time. This is your opportunity. Let's make a house a home. And let's talk about that covering today. If you have a Bible with you this morning, I invite you up with me to the book of Numbers. Numbers. We're going old school today. Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Fourth book of the Bible. We're going to be in Numbers chapter 6. Numbers chapter 6. Now maybe you don't have a Bible, maybe you have a mobile device. You can access version uh, online and pull up the scriptures. Numbers chapter 6 will be in verse 22. Uh, we'll also put the words on the screen so you can follow along with what God's word has to say. Now before we jump into our text today, let me, let me just kind of set the scene. Uh, the children of Israel were slaves in Egypt for 400 years. And, and they called out to God, help, right? Help, we, we need a deliverer. And, and maybe you're here today, man, you just feel like you're in bondage. I mean, things are falling in in your life, and you can call out to God. There's a God who hears you. Praise God. There's a God who will answer your prayer. And so they called out to God, and God sent a man named Moses, a deliverer. And Moses goes to Pharaoh, let my people go. And, and Pharaoh says, no way. You know, I'm making a ton of money off these slaves. And, and Moses goes, these are God's people. And so then these plagues happen. And the last plague, the death angel. And the people are saved because of the blood of the lamb over the doorpost of their home. And the death angel comes, and finally Pharaoh says, okay, you can go. And a million people start walking out of Egypt. I mean, I, I can't even picture that scene. A million people walking out. They cross the Red Sea, and they come to Mount Sinai. And at Mount Sinai, and God meets them. And God says, listen, you are my people. You are my people, and I am your God. And I want to tell you, I have prepared something great for you. I'm taking you into the promised land. And it's a land flowing with milk and honey. It's a land, I'm going to give you houses you didn't build, vineyards you didn't plant. I am going to bless you, but I want to tell you how to live. You see, you've been in Egypt, and you've had these gods, little G, right? You've all been indoctrinated with this. This has been handed down to you. But I'm going to tell you, I am your God. And when you go into the promised land, there's going to be people. You're going to be in a culture. And there's going to be little G gods. But I want to tell you, you are different. You are holy. You are set apart. For my name and my glory. And so when you come in, this is how I want you to live. And he gives them the Ten Commandments. He gives them, if you go through Exodus and Leviticus, and then you get into Numbers, there's 613 laws in the Old Testament. And he was saying this because I want to bless you. I want you to have a great life. I want you to succeed. I want you to stand out and to be different. And so they come, and they receive what God has for them. And then God does this incredible thing in Numbers chapter 6. He starts setting apart different people because he knew when they came into the land that he wanted them to worship him and that they would build a tabernacle they would eventually build a temple put it in the center of their community in a place where they would go and say God you are the Lord of our lives you are the Lord of us and then he says in verse 22 the Lord said to Moses tell Aaron and his sons now Aaron is Moses' brother right and Aaron becomes the head of the priestly line. He becomes the one that, that's going to have priest after priest after priest to be the, the ones to lead the people to God, to keep the people focused on God. So he says, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. 
Now, I've got to stop right there because I think that's so cool. I mean, don't you know that there is a God who loves you? Don't you know that there is a God who is for you? And God making a, a difference in the people's lives by telling them how to live, but then coming back and saying, I want to bless you and I want this to go on for generations. So tell Aaron and his sons, so it goes on down, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. So they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. How awesome. Now some of you may recognize that as this priestly blessing. Some of you may recognize that as something that's read at weddings a lot of time, as a marriage blessing. But you look and God is making a way for his people to be blessed from generation to generation to generation. You know, if you go to a Jewish synagogue today, this is the benediction that they have at the close of their time of worship. And, and the priest will stand up and, and the people will open their hands to receive. And, and the priest will put his hands up like this. And then he will say this priestly blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. He'll say it over the people. And the people won't even look because they're, they believe there's this, this holy moment as God is covering them. As God is blessing them. This covering of peace. This covering of God's blessing in our hearts and in our lives and in our homes. What I want you to see today is a couple of things. Number one is this, that it is a covering, a covering of prayer. A covering of of prayer. May the Lord bless you and keep you. And that your home would be covered in prayer. That your home would be different than every other house on the street. That your home would be different than every other apartment in the complex. That your home would be covered in prayer. A couple of weeks ago, some friends at church called us and said, hey guys, can you come over and bless our house? And, and I was like, okay, yeah, you know, sure, we'll, we'll come over and bless your house. This is great. They were moving into a brand new house. They're amazing friends that are here at our church. They're awesome people. And, and we went over there, and I didn't know, really know what to expect. We were going to pray together. We were going to pray over their house. But when I got there, they had friends. They had family. There was a ton of people there. You know, they had just moved into this new house, and they had all their friends and family over. They had food out. They had a guy from our worship team with a guitar that was there. And I was like, wow, you guys, this is, like, big. And, and they were like, yeah. They said, you know, we didn't want to just move furniture in. We didn't want to just, you know, kind of get a bunch of stuff. We wanted to really dedicate this home to the Lord. And I thought, whoa, that's awesome. And so we stood there and we sang worship songs and we prayed and then we put the whole family in the middle and we just kind of circled around them and prayed a blessing over their home. And I thought, you know, I love that they in their minds said, you know, we want to cover our home in prayer. We want to cover our home in prayer. You see, for you and for me in our homes, right, wherever we live, if we're to cover our home in prayer, number one is this. We've got to be prayerful. We've got to be prayerful. If you're taking notes, this is right there. Number one, you know, be prayerful. And a lot of times you go, oh, that's pretty easy. That's pretty simple. But how often do we pray at home? I mean, how often? I mean, a lot of times we get busy and we're running. We've got different schedules. Everything's happening. And how often do we really stop and pray? God, that you would be glorified in my home. God, that you would be lifted high in my home. How often do we pray together with our spouse? How often do we pray with our kids. You know, every night before my kids go to bed, man, I come in there, I just lay my hand on their head and I just pray over them. It, it's this time of anointing. Now, a lot of times we talk about prayer, we kind of get lost. We're like, ah, I don't know, I'm not great at praying, you know, I don't know what to say. And it's got to be some formula. I mean, do I say the Lord's Prayer or what, what do I say? What do I say? I'm not sure. But prayer is just a conversation with God, right? God, bless our home. God, be with my spouse. God, help them to have a great day. God, be with my kids. It's just Help them to have an awesome day. God, watch over them. There's an incredible story in Mark chapter 9. If you want to read it later, it's great. But, but there's a, a dad who has a son, and his son's sick. And so this dad brings his son to the disciples, Jesus' disciples, to have his son healed. And the disciples try, and they, they're like trying to heal this, this boy, and they can't. And so the dad goes to Jesus and says, uh, Jesus, uh, I took my son over to your disciples, but they couldn't heal him. Jesus, do you think you can? And Jesus is like, do I think I can? You know, I'm just kind of like, and the dad's like, whoa, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sorry. I mean, I know you can, you know. He's like, help my unbelief. You know, this is this whole kind of deal of, hey, I believe, I believe, I believe. And Jesus goes, okay, and he heals the boy. 
he heals him, right? He just restores him right there. He casts this demon out and he restores him. And, and later on, the disciples come up to Jesus and they go, um, Jesus, well, why couldn't we do it? You know, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, what happened? I mean, why, I thought we would be able to do that. Why, why couldn't we do that? And Jesus makes this remarkable statement, Mark chapter 9. Jesus said, this kind of spirit only comes out by prayer. And I think if I'm the disciples, I'm going, but you didn't pray. <laughs> you just said, okay, be cast out. I mean, what, what, you didn't do that. See, what I think Jesus is showing us is living in the spirit of prayer. Just living. You don't have to go through some formula. It's just this constant being mindful that God is with you. That God is present. That God is in your home. That God loves you. That God loves your family. That God is for you. Just be, Whenever I pull in my driveway after I come home, I stop in my driveway before I pull in the garage. And I just say a prayer, a short prayer. I'm just like, God, you know, just let me let things go that need to be let go. And God, let me concentrate as I move into my home. God, as I walk in to be dad, to be husband, Father, give me your Holy Spirit to go before me. Just real simple, real simple. But it makes a difference, it makes an impact. The covering of prayer over your home. It happens, one, as you're prayerful. Be prayerful. Now, being prayerful leads to number two, which is this, to be present. To be present. See, how often are we present in our home? You know what I'm saying? A lot of times we're partially present, right? But what if you had a partially present roof? You know, what if you had a roof that was chicken wire? I mean, you know, is that going to help you? No! I mean, it's not going to help at all. And yet many times, many times, many times, and I'm guilty right here, you know, I'm partially present. And my kids are trying to talk to me, and I'm like, uh, yeah, hold on, hold on, I got this, got this email. Hold on, wait, 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 wait. You know, or sometimes it's like, okay, here, take the iPad, you know, it's all yours, you know. I mean, it's so easy, it's so easy, it's so easy for us to be partially present. You know, the lights are on, but nobody's home, you know, the whole kind of deal. But for us to learn to be home when we're home, for us to learn to engage, right? When your spouse says, how was your day? And you say, Fine. I don't think that's what they're looking for, okay? I mean, I don't think they're going, oh, great, fine, perfect, you know, I'm going to move on. I think there's probably some dialogue or some conversation that they're saying, hey, I want to talk, I want to communicate, and i got to be honest with you, sometimes it's so easy for me because there's so many things going on, and I'm thinking about, you know, who's in the hospital, what do we need to do, who's sick, who's... And it's so easy for me just to kind of disengage, and yet God says, hey, be present, be present, and being prayerful leads me to be present. It allows me then to engage with the people around me. It allows me not only to give my best at work, but then also to give my best at home. To say, I want to be a man after God's heart. I want to bring a covering in my home. Being prayerful, be present. You know what that leads to? Be patient. <laughs> it leads to being patient in our homes. How often do, uh, do we just get so caught up in everything else that we're not patient right anybody else deal with that or is it just me you know I mean it's like I, you've already asked me that question okay come on can we move on I mean and when we calm down and we slow down when we slow down we slow down and we're patient I, I think children should come with a little sign that says handle with care <laughs> because they're so precious and sometimes we get frustrated we're like oh you know but, but just being patient they're learning they're growing they're they're so inquisitive and they're so longing to be with you and to be with me. I think your spouse should have a sign that says, you know, I'm for you. <laughs> I believe in you. You know, we're on the same team. We need to know that. Be prayerful, be present, be patient. It leads to be pure. That your home then begins to have this covering. May the Lord bless you and keep you. That our home is different. That our home is a place of purity. That our home is a place focused on God. That our home is a place where you want to be. There's a covering of prayer. The second thing you see, I think, out of this blessing is this. Is that there's a covering of joy. <laughs> there's a covering of joy. It says, the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. What do you see when you look up at God? What do you see? In your heart, in your life, what do you see when you look up? At God. Do you see a God who's angry at you? Do you see a God who's just waiting for you to mess up? Or do you see a God who's smiling? <laughs> do you see a God who's smiling and saying, hey, listen, I'm for you. I believe in you. 
You are mine. I love you. I care about you. Oh, that our house and our home would be a place of joy. It would be a place of joy. Make your place, make your house a place of joy. Make it a place that's fun. What are you doing to create that in your home? What are you doing to create that? See, here's the fact of the matter is this. You don't get this time back. I don't get this time back. You know what, if you're a kid and you're in middle school, you're in high school, you don't get this time back. And I know it's so easy for you, I know it's so easy for you to think, oh, when I get to high school, when I get to college, when I get out of the house, when I do, listen, don't wish your life away. If you're a young adult, you're a young single adult, you're in college, or you're a young single adult, listen, you don't get this time back. You just don't. And so often you can play this game, but when I get married, or when I'm this, or when I'm that, you know, use this time for God's glory. Paul even said, hey, uh, just stay unmarried, you know, so that you can do greater ministry, greater work. I mean, you know, you don't get this time. You are young married, and listen, you maybe have a baby at home, and you're just going, oh, God, please, I'm not getting any sleep, and I'm so tired. But you don't get this time back. Families, you don't get this time back. Your kids are at a certain age, and it's so easy to wish, man, when they get this and they get that. But grandparents, you don't get this time back. And to be able to pour into your family, to be able to pour into the generations, to embrace this time and to enjoy it. And I think so often we miss it, right? We just miss it because we're so caught up in career. We're so caught up in everything else that's going on in our lives. We're so caught up in the, hey, when's the next vacation? When's the next trip? When's the next this? We got to stop and embrace the moment and say, I don't get this back. I just don't. And I want to create a place that people want to be. I want to have a house of joy. I want to have a home of joy. I don't want to wait till later. I want it now. I want it now. My parents, when I was growing up, they did a great job at this. They made sure that our house was fun. And so that we, my sister and I, we would always have our friends over to our house. Now, my parents were smart. I didn't figure this out till later, right? But my parents were smart because then they knew, they knew who I was hanging out with right? Then they knew who my friends are, and then they knew their parents, because everybody was coming to our house. They always had snacks, you know, snacks. I mean, it gets kids, it works every time, you know, so there were always snacks at our house, and people wanted to come over, they were like, that's going to be the place. My parents knew that, and I just thought, wow, what are you doing to make your house a house of joy? What are you doing just to make it fun? About once a quarter, we have a daddy-daughter date night, you know, so every season, uh, my girls, we have one night where I go out with one of my girls. And so Lisa will keep the other two girls, and then I'll take one of my daughters out on daddy-daughter date night. And so a couple of weeks ago, it was the end of the summer, and so each girl got to pick a night, and we were going to go on our daddy-daughter date night. And uh, Grace, my oldest, is 11, and Mabry's 9, and Kate's 6. And so, you know, Grace picked Monday night, and Mabry Thursday night, and Kate picked Sunday. And I said, why'd you pick Sunday? And she goes, Daddy, listen. They only get like four hours because it's like after work and stuff. But Sunday, after lunch, we get to go out. I get like seven or eight hours with you. <laughs> I was like, wow. <laughs> How'd she figure that out at six? You know, but she was smart. So we just had a blast. We do these fun things. And, and so Grace, my oldest, she's 11. So after work, I pick her up and we go and we play laser chase, you know, first and then we went and ate at Moe's, because it was Moe's Monday, right? Welcome to Moe's. So we go there, and she loves Moe's. So after Moe's, then we went to the Sky Zone place. You know, we had these little coupons, and we jump on trampolines for like 30 minutes. And, and uh, so then we, she thinks we're heading home, and we start to drive home. And then I go, wait, one more place. And we drive to downtown Franklin, and we go to Baskin Robbins, right? And we go to Baskin Robbins, and we each get an ice cream cone. And then we just started walking down the street of downtown Franklin, and we walk. It was a beautiful night. And we're walking, and then we eat our ice cream, we're holding hands, and we, we come back to the car, and she just looks at me, and she said, Daddy, this is the best night of my life. And I just lost it, you know, like, okay, yeah. <laughs> you know, just trying to get in the car and buckle up, you know. God, I, mean, like, I was like, whoa. You know, it's something so simple. I mean, but you know what? She's going to remember that. And I love my girls. I just love my girls. And I realize I'm not going to get this time back, you know. Pretty soon she's going to become a teenager that's like, Daddy dropped me off at the corner, you know. <laughs> but I want to take this time. I want to take this time right now and just embrace it. And for all of us, it takes being intentional 
I mean, really, because right now, you know, life is getting fast, it's getting out of control, and our schedules are getting crazy. But are you scheduling, like, date nights? Are you scheduling time with your roommates? Are you saying, hey, guys, let's just go hang out. Let's have fun. Let's do something. Are you scheduling time with your kids? Are you scheduling time with your friends? you got to make it a priority. And this covering of joy, I think that God just says, hey, I want your home to be different. I want to be different. Enjoy one another. <laughs> Enjoy this time. Embrace this time. And then I think what we see is this. It's a covering of faithfulness. A covering of faithfulness. It says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And give you peace. And I love how God said that to Aaron and said, hey, tell your sons and your sons and your sons and your sons and the generations of God's faithfulness to his people and give you peace. This word peace, it's literally shalom. And it doesn't mean an absence of war, but what it means is fullness. It means that everything is right. It means that God and creation and man are at peace. There's peace. You know, the Jews would say shalom, you know, and shalom is hello, shalom is also goodbye. I mean, they say shalom, shalom, shalom all the time, you know. But what are they saying? That there's this fullness that comes, this peace. And may he give you peace. Is there peace in your home? Is there? You know where that peace comes from? That peace comes from God. And a lot of times we're in our home and we're stressed out because everybody's doing this, everybody's got this schedule and things going on. And a lot of times we're trying to kind of manage all the stress in our home versus saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, right here. <laughs> Let me, 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 me be focused on God. Let me find my worth and my value in God. Let me be a person at peace. Let me bring that peace into my home. Is there peace in your marriage? It doesn't mean an absence of fighting. I mean, sometimes there's going to be struggles, right? Two imperfect people are getting married. You know, the Bible says is iron sharpens iron. So when man sharpens another, what happens when iron sharpens iron? I mean, there's some sparks that fly, right? I mean, it's okay. I mean, that makes us better. But is there peace? Is there peace? I have some good friends, and when they get in fights, you know, they stop. One of them will stop and say, wait a minute, we're on the same team, right? We're on the same team, so we got to work together here. we got to work together. Is there peace in your marriage? Is there peace with your kids? If you're a parent, is there peace with your kids? Again, it doesn't mean an absence of fighting. I mean, kids are moving from dependence to independence. This is a journey, and if you're a parent or a grandparent, you, you, you watch this journey take place. That's healthy. They're going to push the boundaries. They're going to try to see where the lines are. You did it. I did it. We all have done it, right? But now you've got to help bring peace into that situation and know the battles to fight and know the when to take a stand and say hey we are different we are followers of Christ our lives should look different but I am for you and I want to impact generations you know what's amazing to me is, is if, if you're a parent you know what you have little eyes watching you and they're watching how you treat your parents and that's how they're going to treat you one day they're watching what you do in your home, and that's what they're going to do one day. It's this faithful, it's this generational thing that you and I have to start to think about. It's not just here and now, it's what is to come that we are creating in our homes. It's legacy. It's God's faithfulness. Isaiah 26.3 says, you will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast in you because he trusts in you, because he trusts in you, because he trusts in you. That's where it comes back to. Now, here's what I want to get to right here. This is so powerful because this is known as the priestly blessing, right? But what happens when you move into the New Testament? Jesus comes, right? The great high priest comes. And when Christ died on the cross for your sins and for my sins, what did he do? He paid the price for us. And when you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, as God draws you to himself, and you step over that line, and you become a follower of Jesus, God places his Holy Spirit within you. And here's something remarkable. It says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, But you, you are a chosen people, a royal, what? Priesthood. A holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into 
wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. See, the fact is this. There's a doctrine called the priesthood of the believer. That you and I then step into that role as the priest in our home. As the spiritual leader in our home. Men, you're the spiritual leader in your home. You're the spiritual leader. Women, you're the spiritual leader in your home. You, you don't have to go to a priest, right, because of the grace of God. You don't have to go to a priest to, to, you know, hey, priest, will you talk to God and tell God this so that for my family? You don't have to confess your sins to a priest. You have a direct relationship with God. Therefore, you, because of God's Holy Spirit in you, you then step into your home and you are the spiritual leader there. And you are the one that becomes the incarnate Christ in your home. You are the one that prays the blessing, the covering over your home, your apartment, your townhome, your condo. God has called you. And by the power of his grace and through his Holy Spirit, you are stepping into that role. Now, some of you may be going, well, you know what? Uh, I don't know about that, right? I don't know enough about the Bible. I don't know enough about what to say. I don't really know what to do. L listen, listen, it's not about that. What is it about? It's about Christ in you, the hope of glory. And it's about you and I growing into that role and accepting that role and being who God has called us to be. Bruce Springsteen, the boss, he said this, a time comes when you need to stop waiting for the man you want to become and start being the man you want to be. You need to stop waiting for the man you want to become and start being the man you want to be. And the time is now for all of us. We don't get this time back. The time is now for all of us to step in and to be the man or the woman that God has called you to be. To be the spiritual leader in your home. Nobody else could do that but you. And it's your time. It's your opportunity. You know, one of my favorite people in the Bible is a guy named Joshua. I love this guy. You know, and we're in Numbers chapter 6. In Numbers chapter 13, they walk to the promised land. They're standing on the edge of the promised land. And they decide to send some spies in the land. You've heard this story, right? And they send 12 spies to spy out the land. And these 12 spies come back and they go, whoa, God wasn't lying. This place is awesome. It is a land flowing with milk and honey. There are vineyards, there are homes, there's rivers. It's awesome. We've been living in a desert. Look at this place. But 10 of the spies go, oh, but there's giants in the land. We can't take it, you know? Oh, never mind that God just brought us out of Egypt. But you know what? We can't take that land. There's no possible way. And two guys stood up, Joshua and Caleb. And Joshua and Caleb said, guys, let's go. God is faithful. God is faithful. God is faithful. Let's go. And the people said, no way. <laughs> and so God said, okay, take a few laps around the desert. For 40 years, they walked around the desert. And the entire generation dies off except for two guys, Joshua and Caleb, men of faith, men who impact generations, men who stood up and stood out for the glory of God. 40 years later, they stand on that exact same place. And Joshua says, let's go. And they walk into the land, and they conquer. In Joshua chapter 24, Joshua's an old man by now, right? But he pulls all the people together, I mean, a million plus people. And they renew their covenant at Shechem. And they renew this covenant to God. And then Joshua says this in verse 14. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river. Right? The, the gods maybe that have been passed down to you, the gods that you saw that came down when you were in Egypt, you know, the polytheism, they worshiped the sun god and all these gods for everything. You know, are you going to do that? Or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're living, are you going to fall in love with the gods of culture? Are you going to allow those gods to dominate what your home looks like? But, I love this. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. But as for me and my household, I don't care what anything else you do, you know, but for me and my household, 
We're going to serve the Lord. We're going to be different. We're going to stand up for God. When I stood on an altar one day and I made a commitment to my wife, Lisa, and inside our wedding ring, we put Joshua 24, 15. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to serve the Lord. Joshua said, choose. You've got to make a choice. You know what? You've got to make a choice. What are you going to do? What's your home going to be like? What decision will you make? Would you cover your home in Christ? Would you find your worth and your value in Christ? Would you allow Christ to just cover you today? I don't know where you are. Maybe spiritually it's been a long time since you've really met God. But today God is saying, I'm here for you. And it's time for you and I to step up and to be who God has called us to be. I want to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes just for a moment. Right where you sit. Would you be honest with God today? Are you living in a house or are you living in a home? You know, it doesn't start with trying to fix everybody around you. It starts with you, your heart, your life. Has there been a time in your life when you've said yes to Christ? Is God's drawing you to himself? Is God's inviting you in to a relationship with him? Has there been a time that you've said, yes, Jesus, I want you to be the Lord of my life. Forgive me for my mistakes. Forgive me for my sins. God, redeem me and restore me. God, I'm yours. Maybe in your life you look and you just have seen generational sin that's been passed down, passed down, passed down. And maybe it's anger or alcoholism or pornography I don't know what it is but would you today just put a stake in the ground that says it stops here our homes can be different maybe for you you know what Christ hasn't been the center of your home and today you just say I want him to be I want him to be the foundation I want to live under that covering that blessing I want to be who God's called and created me to be. And maybe this morning it's praying for your roommates or praying for your spouse or praying for your kids. Now, Father God, we are here today. And God, we've come to meet you. God, that our lives would be all about you. That we would today say, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Not the God of culture, not the God of our forefathers, but today, Father, we will serve you. And Father, I pray for a legacy that will impact generations. I pray that, God, you would do something so great. God, that it would just reverberate through our family tree. And when people look back, they would say, hey, my dad or my mom or my grandfather or my grandmother, my great, great, great grandfather, man, they lived for the Lord. There was something different about them. Thank you. So, Father, we, we know it all comes from you. And today we ask and pray for that covering of your blessing, that covering of your grace. Fill us, God, with peace, the peace that passes understanding. Give us peace that we may live our lives for you. And in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. After the service, I'll be here. There'll be people on our staff, our pastoral care team. If you want somebody to talk with you, somebody to pray with you, that's what we're here for, right? You're not in this by yourself. You've got a God who is for you, and you've got a church that wants to walk with you and surround you. At this time, I want to invite our ushers to come forward. It's a chance for us to give back to God. A chance for us to invest in His kingdom and for His glory. And so as our ushers come, we've all been blessed beyond measure. And it's a chance for us to respond. If you're a first-time guest, all we ask is that you would fill out that little communication card in your worship guide. And just place it in the offering as your offering. And we could follow up with you and tell you what God's doing here and ways to get involved. Um, during our offering time, you're going to see a video just talking about community groups. As community groups or sign-ups are happening today. And just encourage you to think and pray about that. Being a part of sharing life with other people. That, that encouragement that we all need. So, Father, thanks for a chance to give back to you. Take what is given. 
Bless it and use it for your name and for your glory, God. Lord, thank you for the way you provide for us so generously in our lives. And God, find us faithful, Father, to trust you every day. We love you. In the name of Jesus, we pray and we give. Amen. Amen. My name is Kristen Dennis. My name is Brad Dennis. Um, we've been going to Rolling Hills for three years now. We have been coming to Rolling Hills, and we came on Sundays, and everybody was friendly and nice and smiling, but we felt like we didn't really know anybody. So we thought community group would be a great opportunity to jump in and meet people and have just a group of people that we could get to know better. And so we talked to Laura and said we'd like to host a group. And a few weeks later, she put 10 strangers at our house. And it was, it was scary in the beginning. We didn't know any of these people. But now I, they, I really and truly can say that they are our family. I would encourage anyone who's considering uh, joining a community group to do it, to take that plunge and, and, and take the risk because you don't get the opportunity to reap the rewards um, if you don't take that you know, first step. And, and it can be a little bit scary and it can be a little bit you know, nerve wracking at first, but yeah, it's, it's totally worth it. And there's you know, some really awesome moments you know, that we've got to experience as a group um, that we would have otherwise never you know, got to experience without our community group. I think everybody gets a little different message from the sermons um, Sunday morning, and so having you know a group of people um, and kind of being able to relay sort of what they took from the uh, message has really been very interesting for me, and I've gained a lot of insight, a lot of perspective from hearing what other people thought um, about you know about the message. I think the greatest thing for me has just been the lifelong friends that we've made. I really think I will be friends with these people for life having those people that you see and you look forward to seeing every Sunday morning, uh, but then also you get to see them again, you know, at the community group later on. It's been, it's been really great for us. It also, I feel like, has launched us into serving more. Since we've joined a community group, we've started uh, Worship One, Serve One. I joined Mom to Mom. I, anytime they ask for volunteers, I'm like, me, I'm there, because I know I can meet people. We've done a number um, of service uh, outings, really, over the last year. Our group's commitment to service has been, um, it for me was was kind of a new uh, thing and so I wasn't totally comfortable with it to begin with but the more we've done it the more I've really you know sort of enjoyed that and, and really kind of had looked forward to those opportunities um, and I think it's been you know a really you know, great experience for us. Do it, join a group. It, you may be nervous and like Brad said you may be a little bit apprehensive about doing it but it is very very worth it. It's really helped me to be more aware, I think, of sharing the love of Christ and showing that, you know, in my everyday actions. I feel like when I go to church on Sundays now that I, I know so many more people um, than I used to know, and it just makes the church feel like even more of a home. I appreciate Brad and Kristen's honesty. It can be nerve-wracking when you have no idea who people are or what's going to happen but it is so rewarding. I have had the privilege of hosting a group in my home for 10 years now. And at Rolling Hills, we, we mix them up every now and again because it's good for you, it's good for growth, it's good to include new people. And I started thinking back of all the people that have been in my home, it was overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And they have poured into me and they have loved me. They know my kitchen better than I know my kitchen because I'm not much of a cook. <laughs> so they take over. It's wonderful. So we want to help you. I would love for our community group leaders and hosts to stand. If you're leading a group or hosting a group this year, I see you out there. Come on. There you go. There you go. Uh, these people are awesome. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your willingness and your hospitality. And um, I'm going to ask Jeff just to pray a blessing over you as leaders, and then we'll close. Yeah. Let's pray for the leaders. If you're around one, just kind of place a hand around them, and let's pray a blessing over them. Father, thank you for these leaders, God, who are opening their home. Father, thank you for their willingness to teach, Father, and to pour into us. And Father, as we grow as disciples and we learn your word and we study your word, Father, I, I pray for everybody here, God, who who maybe is apprehensive about being a part of a group. And God, that you would just give them peace about that. And Father, they would take that step of faith. And so bless these leaders and bless this year. Father, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, church, let's stand together. Let me pray a blessing over all of us. And we are off to have a great, great year.
Here's what I want to do. If you will just, we're going to put this prayer back up, Numbers chapter 6. And if you'll just put your hands out, and let me just pray this over you. You ready to receive this? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Receive that today and let's live it this week in our home. Have a great week. God bless. Thanks for being here.